Dear Sega, hi, it's me, Austin. You know, I've been intentionally trying to leave you alone because our channel has done a lot, and I mean a lot of Sonic videos. I was actually just trying to play Sonic Mania to relax and relive some childhood wonderment and recreate the excitement I got playing Sonic at a friend's house since my family was a Nintendo family, which ultimately was the right choice. I mean, sure, they had Sonic and Toe Jam and Earl, Altered Beast and Echo the Dolphin, but they also had the Sega CD and the Sega 32X, while the SNES had the FX chip, Mega Man X, Donkey Kong Country, freaking Super Mario RPG, Castlevania, Final Fantasy VI, and Judge Dredd. What, you didn't play the 1995 classic video game tie-in to the Sylvester Stallone movie Judge Dredd? Wow! Fake gamer alert! Okay, I'm not here to reignite the flames of the console wars that died before most of you were even born, and no, I was just kidding about the fake gamer thing, because if I wanted to actually flex my muscles on an obscure-ish game you didn't play on the SNES but should've, it wouldn't be Judge Dredd. It'd be Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. Where was I? Oh right, Sonic the Hedgehog. I will never not love classic platforming games, and that's why they're one of my favorite ways to relax and just kill time when I want to shut my brain off for a while, but dang it, my nitpicky science brain has some sort of stealth mode where it just sits there, passively observing while I'm trying to have fun and relax, but fine. Maybe if I just give in and scratch this itch, I can finally get back to doing what I enjoy, and the beast will be sated, albeit temporarily. Once again, we're talking about Sonic's running, because literally what else is there to even talk about when that's literally 98% of the dude's entire brand? And the thing is, we're not talking about how surprisingly slow he is, although that is part of it, and we will get to it because it's definitely a classic and necessary for where we're going. Instead, what we're going to be talking about today is this, the loop-de-loop, -loop, a cornerstone of all the Sonic games, even the bad ones. These things are awesome, and they're one of the first things you experience in the franchise, making an appearance little under halfway into the very first level Green Hill Zone 1. Just far enough in to give you a few seconds to get used to the game's mechanics, and dang are they super fun and amazing and make no freaking sense! We've talked a lot about how loops and rings work on this show, specifically how they're used to simulate gravity, but we haven't talked about how they can be used for fun. Although, interestingly, the way loops like this work and the way halo rings work are not that different, to tell the truth. Both of them work by redirecting velocity, or rather, changing it, and the only real difference between the two is where the energy is coming from. On a halo ring, you appear to be stationary, but you're actually moving tangentially. That is, this direction, and the rotation of the ring is redirecting your velocity as you run into it on a microscopic level. The energy that's making you feel the sensation of gravity is already in the system as the rotating ring. This is exactly how a loop-de-loop -loop on, like, uh, I don't know, a roller coaster works, too, except instead of the energy already being in the system, you put energy into it in the form of your initial speed entering it. It's you that has the energy. Instead of being stationary, and that's stationary with air quotes, since technically you're not stationary, but you are stationary with respect to the- Gah! You see how this can get out of hand really quickly? You stand on one location of the ring, and the ring moves, and from some frame of reference, that is stationary. Is that good enough for you? Well, too bad! We're moving on anyway! Instead of being air quotes stationary, in the case of the loop-de-loop, -loop, you are not stationary, and each instant as you move forward, your velocity, which is tangent as well to the loop, is redirected by hitting the surface of the loop. This is what allows you to seemingly defy gravity in a roller coaster by going upside down and then traveling onwards. And it's also what keeps you in your seat. If you're traveling fast enough, not only do you continue to move all the way through the loop, the g-forces caused by the constantly changing velocity, since acceleration is change of velocity over time, and that's literally what force is, you will actually be pushed into your seat, defying the force of gravity from the Earth. Anyway, that's how loop-the-loops are possible. You move fast enough and redirect your energy enough, you can totally make it through a loop. Simple enough? WRONG! This stuff is complicated. 
You know the difference between a roller coaster and, I don't know, your feet? Everything. Absolutely everything everything. And Sonic is totally capable of running through these loops even if he's not in ball form and that changes everything. Now before you go there I do know about the Pepsi Max loop running guy which we can't show footage of because it's been scrubbed from the internet by Pepsi for some reason and I do not want to go up against them and their team of copyright lawyers. But yes running through a loop is possible and here's a picture of Damon Waters a free runner part way through pulling it off. The problem is that our feet are not wheels and operate completely completely differently and transfer forces way less efficiently than wheels. It's literally why we invented the wheel. You may not think about this too often, but walking, especially bipedal walking, is very hard. I actually had a really long section here explaining the physics of running and why it's different from wheels when it comes to creating forward movement. And while it is really cool, it didn't really add anything to the episode, but if you're a patron of mine at Patreon, you get access to some of this cut content. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge patreon.com slash the science yt Anyway, our feet are great, but they're way less efficient than wheels at redirecting velocity. Meaning that running a loop like this is going to require not only a lot more kinetic energy in order to successfully pull it off, but it's gonna require very strong leg muscles in order to handle the increased g-forces, especially at the beginning section. This isn't a deal breaker really, but it is something for you to keep in mind if you're gonna try to do this trick yourself. But enough theory, let's get to the numbers, what you're actually here for. Since Sonic is capable of running entirely around the loop, we have a couple of things going in our favor. One of them being that we can actually easily calculate how fast he needs to be going at bare minimum at the very top of the loop in order to make it around to the other side. If he can make it here, going fast enough in order to assure that his feet will continue to make contact and find resistance allowing him to keep moving forward, he should be golden. And the formula for this is very, very simple. Velocity equals the square root of gravity divided by the radius of the loop. Simple, right? Well, yes and no. We have a few problems, the biggest of them being that we need to do pixel measurements and we don't have a ruler. Thankfully, Japan has us covered and have provided for us not only a cannon height, but a cannon weight for Sonic. And this is gonna become important later. Sonic's height, according to this website, is exactly one meter. And we're gonna need this for, well, absolutely everything. When Might Be Awesome did a video on this three years ago, a video, which is awesome by the way, and I totally recommend you give it a watch after this one, he assumed that there was a 9.8 meters per second gravity for the purposes of his math, but if there's one thing I've learned from doing this job for nearly half a decade, it's that gravity in video games is almost never the same as the gravity on Earth. In fact, it's often way stronger than Earth's gravity, mainly because it makes platforming a way more enjoyable and fast-paced activity, and since the minimum speed formula is dependent on gravity and gravity is the main force getting in the way of successfully running one of these loops, it's kind of important that we measure it. And after carefully timing a 513 pixel fall, which is a distance of 6.58 meters according to our blue ruler, and knowing that it took Sonic approximately 0.783 seconds to make this fall, we can plug in all of our unknowns into this handy formula, 2D divided by time squared, to get our gravity, which is 21.43 meters per second squared, or over two times Earth's gravity, which, you know, isn't all that bad for a video game. I've seen way worse. Knowing this, we also need the radius of our loop, which turns out to be just over exactly two sonics, or 2.03 meters. Knowing all of this, we can just plug our numbers into this formula to get the blue blur's minimum speed he needs to maintain at the top of the loop in order to keep from falling down and cracking his skull open. And that answer turns out to be 6.6 .6 meters per second, or 14 miles per hour, which is surprisingly low. However, this is where we begin to run into problems. After running extensive testing, I learned two things about Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, he's surprisingly slow, very fast for a hedgehog, but not that fast for a video game. What's more, he has a max acceleration when he's just running, that is, not when he's doing his little rev up ball thing, of about 3.47 meters per second squared. We'll get into why that's important later, and what's more, the game shows him to be capable
capable of pulling off a successful running of the loop when his speed running into the loop is only 5.03 meters per second. This is below the minimum 6.6 .6 meters per second he needs to reach by the time he gets to the top of the loop. Is it possible that he continues accelerating up the loop so he's able to reach 6.6 .6 meters per second by the time he gets there? No, it is not. There is a reason I measured this guy's acceleration and that's because the instant he starts curving upwards, he's going to be fighting gravity even more than he is normally on flat ground. And under 2.1 Gs, that adds up pretty quickly. At first, it's barely more than he normally experiences, but at some point between where he enters the loop and the 90 degree point where gravity is directly opposing his tangential vector and pulling him the opposite direction of both his velocity and his acceleration, the acceleration from gravity is going to completely cancel out his forward acceleration. The good news is that this means he won't begin to slow down until he crosses whatever this threshold is. The bad news is that with two Gs and a slow max acceleration of 3.47 meters per second squared, this means the closer he gets to the line, the less he's going to accelerate. The fastest way to figure out at what point along the loop Sonic will stop accelerating forward is to use vector sums to figure out at what angle gravity has to be to zero out 3.47 meters per second squared. And to do that, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is... Take the square root of the sum of the squares of 3.47 meters per second squared and 21.4 meters per second squared in order to get your b vector. Don't worry about what that is, it's not important, but the answer is 21.15 meters per second squared. And when you take the gravity vector, 21.4, divide it by 21.15, the b vector, take the arc tangent or inverse tangent of the answer to get 44 degrees, subtract that from 180 degrees to figure out the angle gravity needs to be at from your acceleration vector, and bada bing, bada boom, you get 135 degrees. Woo! Which means, when Sonic is only 2.4 meters into the loop, or about 18% of the way through, not even a quarter of the way up, all of his forward acceleration is cancelled out by gravity, meaning he only reaches a top speed of 5.8 meters per second before it starts falling again. Meaning he would not be able to make it to the top of the loop safely. BOOM! MATH! But, eh, that's the absolute slowest Sonic can make the loop in-game. I can forgive that. What if he's running at top speed? speed, would he be able to make it then? Well, his top not balled up speed is 10.3 meters per second, which is already promising because it's faster than the minimum 6.6 .6 meters per second that we need. And it was here that I was tempted to use calculus and jerks, which are an actual unit, I promise you that, in order to figure out if this would work. But there's a better way, thankfully, that does not involve calculus, and it boils down to one simple principle, energy balance. You see, Sonic, at this here hat right here above the ground at the top of the loop has energy and we can calculate what it is. Technically, we don't need to know his mass, although it's helpful. We just need to know that the energy that's up here at this peak is less than or equal to the energy Sonic has as he enters the loop. As he enters the loop, his energy is entirely kinetic energy. As he rises up, however, and begins to slow down, that kinetic energy starts to change into potential energy, which is the amount of energy Sonic is essentially storing as uh, the energy he would release if he fell to the ground. At the very peak of this loop, his kinetic energy is at its lowest and his potential energy is at its highest before it begins to switch back again as he runs down the other side of the loop and it turns back into kinetic energy. So our friends in Japan said that Sonic weighs 35 kilograms, meaning at the peak here, using the kinetic energy formula of one half mass times velocity squared, if Sonic is going the minimum speed of 6.6 6 meters per second, he's got 762 joules of kinetic energy, which we can add to his potential energy, which is mass times gravity times height, which gets us 3,049 joules of potential energy. See? That's much, much higher than his kinetic energy. Adding these two together, we get a total energy requirement of 3,811 joules, energy that Sonic needs to put into this system in order to pull off this loop properly, which we can get by rearranging the kinetic energy formula to put velocity on this side and plug in our numbers, which nuggets, why did I write nuggets? Plug our numbers in, which gets us 14.75 meters per second as a bare minimum speed Sonic needs to be going in order to pull off this loop. Way more than he's doing even when he's running at top speed, which is more like 10 meters per second. That's over 33 
3 miles per hour, the speed limit of most small towns and neighborhoods in America. I'm starting to doubt this guy can make this loop at all, you little liar. Not to mention that he'd be experiencing at least 7 Gs of peak force pulling all his blood directly out of his head, increasing the chance that he'd pass out and end up smacking his head against the side of the loop. But here is where the game finally saves us, because I still haven't tested his revved up ball form, which not only goes much faster than him on foot, it also seems to behave like an actual ball, meaning that it would be way more efficient at changing velocity than feet would. In a fully revved up ball form, Sonic passes 280 pixels in 13 frames, which is 3.59 meters per 0.2167 seconds, which becomes a speed of 16.57 meters per second, which is bigger than 14.75 meters per second, which means we did it! Son of a gun, we did it! The absolute mad lad pulled it off! Yeah! Finally, something is an unambiguous win for a video game in one of my shows. We'll just sidestep answering the question of how Sonic somehow avoids getting a chronic case of vertigo and vomiting all over Stardust Speedway from all that violent spinning. As a brief aside, this website claims that he can travel at the speed of sound, which is utterly ridiculous. Don't even get me started on how stupid that, you stupid blue blur! Better luck next time, Sonic! Sincerely, Austin. Here's a shout out to all the patrons who make me making goofy videos like this possible. Mazer, Nicholas Holloway, Siggy, Nick Patterson, John Ray, Shuri, Nicholas Spilling, Spilling, oh dear, Nicholas Spillinger, Dan Robb, Adam TP, Jean-Luc Stempel, Donna Cook, Angel Berg, Matt, Alexander Beecher, Emerald Tawny, Royal Gaming 16, Sydney, The Lame Lime, Willie Saka, Willie Cicado, Iarinu, why did I not think this through ahead of time? Cal Odenthal, James Pinkert, Francis Gag, oh no. Francis Gagnon, Tay Shia, oh no, what have I done? Kovian Lanier, Jeremy Lusignan, Josh and Hannah Katner, Emma Sims, Joshua Bowden, Draven Stanley, Steph DeBuser, and all these other people for contributing to my Patreon. You guys rock. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and please forgive me if I butchered your name. <laughs>